Hello and welcome to another episode of Memento Mal. In this episode, we'll cover Dr. Tellus Four Marie, better known as Tellus. Care to introduce yourself and give a quick overview of your project? Yeah, hi. So, yeah, I just go by the short form of my name, Tellus. And I'm from the University of Guelph. I'm doing my PhD and I'm in my last year. So, my project uh, that we'll be talking about today is on uh, a novel way of dynamic LEDs for greenhouses and controlled environments like vertical farms. So the idea is, um, can we grow plants under continuous light? Because theoretically, if a plant is constantly photosynthesizing, maybe we'll get higher yields, right? Um, so. Can we grow plants under continuous light? Well, that's not the case. Some plants get injury, like photoperiodic injury. Tomato is particularly susceptible. Um, so we need to do something uh, with this continuous light treatment to make the plant um, able to withstand that sort of stress. Uh, and it, it kind of dives into um, ways to do that uh, there's like physiological ways, like there might be like something wrong with the metabolism. Oh, maybe you could do this with a gene and that with a gene. So there's other universities working on that. But what I'm interested in is in training the circadian rhythm. Uh, so really, you could take any plant. And as long as you're giving it uh, entrainment cues at the right times of day, uh, that would make the plant, we'll just say think or understand or, or just act the way it should at that time of day and transition through its different pre-programmed cycles. Uh, that's kind of a long-winded way of explaining it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so there's about six questions we have. You mentioned in, what, in the podcast you did, link in the description below, of course, six, uh, successful LED method would be 12 to, 16, 12 to 16 hours of red light during the day. And blue LED light lengths would be 12 to 8 hours. Same yield as, as the control method and same amount of money spent. Can you explain? Because the normal means would be lights go off at night. But if you have lights going on all throughout the day, all the day anyway. How does that equate for the same yield? Yeah, so this that's um, one of the, the background slides of the show. And that's work that my predecessor did. So uh, Jason Lanou, and he's at the AAFC, a research station in Paro, Ontario, that does greenhouse production. So that's referring to studies that he's published. Um, and the idea is, so in a greenhouse, this isn't a completely controlled environment, this is in a greenhouse. What they did was they gave uh, red LEDs during the day and, you know, like probably, uh, I can't remember exactly how much, I think it was in the range of like 100 to 150 uh, PPFD uh, or just micromoles per meter second square, uh, the light intensity. and then right at the end of that photo period during the day the day length could have been 12 hours or 16 hours uh, there's studies on both lengths um, then right as soon as it reaches that 12 or 16 hours the lights immediately switch light quality to a blue led and that blue led is much dimmer it's about 50 micromoles per meter second squared at canopy height and so that creates kind of uh, a weird, well, not weird, but a different rhythm that the plant could kind of respond to. So it's not, it's changing the light quality and it's not experiencing the same light intensity from those LEDs at all times. It switches the intensity as well. So um, that whole research started inspiring questions like, okay, well, how did these plants, um, you know, produce well? Uh, under those conditions compared to like the control 
So there's kind of like, there, there's technically like a positive and a negative control. So a regular, like just a regular control is that, okay, well, what if you supplied uh, that red and blue LED, the same intensities or the same daily light integral, if you just summed it all up for a 24 hour period for just that 16 hour photo period. So that's a control, the same DLI, but just at the 16 hour versus the special treatment that stretches that same DLI, but now separates the red from the blue for day and nighttime. And then another one is, okay, well, what if you just kept it red, blue LED, same DLI, and it doesn't change intensity and it doesn't change anything throughout the whole day. And so it's just constant. So you kind of got these three levels uh, of ways you could go about it. So the special dynamic way, that one was able to, uh, maintain well in cucumbers for example and uh, tomatoes and greenhouse pepper it was able to maintain the same yield as control so uh, the plants they all yielded the same and why this is important it's because if you were to give uh, that control led you know, it needed to be, let's just say 200 micromole per meter second squared, PPFD. Let's just say it had to be 200 over a 16 hour period, but that is during the daytime. And so electrical prices uh, from any provider, uh, generally across the world, it's a pretty common thing, uh, but it, it's different region to region. But electricity is more expensive during daytime, like, you know, like because various industries all places they need electricity at daytime so there's a high demand whereas at nighttime electricity is a lot cheaper so that's called off-peak pricing so if you could stretch out the amount of electricity you need into the nighttime you're going to save money so that's the whole strategy here is well how can we stretch out the photo period or our lighting scheme um, and use less on-peak electricity and stretch it into the off-peak electricity yet still supply the same DLI. So that's just for the purposes of experiment. Um, out of the, so tomato and uh, greenhouse pepper, they both thrived under this dynamic uh, LED recipe. They didn't get this classic kind of injury. They get the photoperiodic injury uh, under continuous light, um, like it did in that other kind of, you could call it a negative control where or maybe it's positive control sorry i'm mixing them up <laughs> um where we were expecting injury and got injury in the ones where it was 24 hours of lighting that didn't change um but cucumber though cucumber is a bit more tolerant it was able to it performed the same no matter what you did so cucumber technically could it be even cheaper uh without even having to change the electricity or uh, the spectrum and stuff thank you yeah, I hope that clears that up a bit. I kind of fumbled it around. Just light during the day and turn off at night. Things like the day, including night versus 12 hours to 16 hours red day to 12 to 8 hours blue light at night. So that, that explains a lot. Uh, thank you for that. I'm wondering if you can explain next the circadian rhythm of plants and the within the, your experiment. Yeah, um, I guess a good way to explain this uh, this thing of circadian rhythms is to kind of also look at people too. So pretty much all higher life, uh, all like eukaryotes that are multicellular. Um, they all have a certain circadian rhythm and they're quite similar across like all species. Um, of course, there's some differences in exactly what the transcription factors are for the feedback loops and all of this. And you could, you could try and tease it all apart, but fundamentally and functionally, they're very similar. So uh, when I, I kind of flip back and forth, even in that, that other uh, webinar, I flip back and forth between, you know, people, plants and insects. Um, 
and I'm, I'm more so referring to the function of a circadian rhythm rather than trying to pinpoint an exact feedback loop. So what a circadian rhythm does in all of these uh, organisms is that it kind of like, imagine that you have a daily budget of energy and you have a lot of processes to maintain in your metabolism. Like there's a lot, of, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a, it's, it's very complicated with the amount of stuff going on in a cell at a given time. Um, how many things that have to be upkept? Um, so what the circadian rhythm does in one part is it kind of like, it'll prioritize different cellular processes to be upregulated at different times of day so that they could receive the energy they need, like the maximum input of energy they need for that day or some sort of other signaling. Um, it, it's, it's, it implicates a lot of different factors, but it kind of makes it so each time of day, there's something else that the whole organism is focused on on the cellular level and even multicellular level that tries to coordinate your overall energy metabolism. And it also, not only is it trying to like energy budget all of these different priorities, but depending on the time of day, uh, you have different, you know, energy intake um, changes as well. Like, you know, we don't eat in the middle of the night. Like we get hungry during the day at particular times of the day, depending on how like in sync we are. And so we'll get hungry and then that creates like, okay, well, you're going to need to be able to digest that food that you just intake. Like, so there's that hunger signal that comes. Then there's all of the metabolism that has to be ready for when that food comes in and anticipates it. So the circadian rhythm has a lot of this anticipating function. Um, and then you're going to have a huge spike of energy in your bloodstream, like blood glucose is going to start going. Your insulin is then going to have to start doing something with that. And you're going to have to start storing all of that uh, in your like liver uh, or in plants. They store it into starch and whatnot. So you have to manage all of this energy uh, flux going in and out uh, throughout the time of day. Um, so that's kind of like... I guess like a, a broad function aspect of it. Um, now, how it pertains to my research is that if you were using the human example, so I'm, I think we've all experienced jet lag. Uh, and jet lag happens when, you know, you're in the environment at your home right now, uh, you're experiencing these day night cycles and your internal circadian rhythm, your own feedback loops of metabolism and everything are synchronized or they're in resonance with your environmental uh, cycles, like your environmental day-night cycles. And that's a lot of these inputs are through like light, they're through temperature fluctuations, or they're even through diet and other factors. But right now you're synchronized. When you fly in a plane somewhere far, and there's a huge shift in the external time that you suddenly encounter. So your internal clock is operating, let's say, six hours in the past, and now you're six hours in the future. So you had what's called a phase shift. So your environmental signal is now totally shifted from what your internal system was expecting. So that creates a moment of chaos in your metabolism. So you can't you're not able to anticipate anything. Um, you, you know, you feel like hungry or maybe you feel kind of awake, but you're not tired enough. And you're like in this weird headache kind of state, if it's like that bad. And it generally takes like at least three to five days of a steady re-entrainment to finally feel normal again after this jet lag. So what's happening in our research on plants is that tomato um, it's very sensitive to perturbations in its circadian rhythm because it's got re a relatively like weaker circadian rhythm than uh, other species. Uh, even cultivars within it vary. But when we grow it under continuous light, like, you know, imagine like it, it doesn't know 
if it's day or night. Let's say it's in a completely controlled environment. There's no other signals to tell it when is when. And so it's, its metabolism is just out of sync. It doesn't know like whether to open the stomata or to close the stomata or to upregulate more photosynthetic proteins. But it does to a certain level, like it is receiving light. It is getting these inputs. So it, it then kind of sets and like kind of reaches like this steady state level where it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to be stuck at this level now. And it, and it kind of, it might have small circadian rhythms, but not enough to synchronize the whole. And so the plant eventually gets this injury and, you know, it's yellow, like its leaves get all yellow and chlorotic and stuff. So it's not, not in a healthy state. So, um, yeah, if that helps a little bit, <laughs> I think in the webinar, I gave a pretty good, um, background. I, I like, like I'm very conceptual with images and stuff. So it's hard for me to do it with my hands. <laughs> but, so going from that, could you explain what the full results of your experiment were? Yeah. So we gave, um, these special dynamic LED cues. Uh, now, the experiments that I did, they resembled Jason's experiments that we started this conversation with, uh, but they were in completely controlled environments. So no greenhouse or anything, like a totally controlled growth chamber to hold everything constant. And um, then I would apply either just a constant light or I would apply this uh, dynamic strategy that would, um, it kind of, it starts at, let's just say, grow light intensity. Uh, and from, let's say, it turns on at 8 a.m. It goes to about 10 a.m. And then it receives a nice high blue light pulse for uh, three hours on top of that grow light spectrum. And blue light is important because if you go out in the middle of the afternoon, and you measured the solar spectrum, there's a lot of blue in that. And there, that there's a lot of significance in the photoreceptors of the plant to blue and how that inputs the circadian rhythm. So that blue pulse is important. Then it comes back down only after three hours, goes back to control uh, or like grow light intensity. And then at the end of the subjective photo period, <laughs> like 16 hours, it then goes down to a dim uh, I had it between 50 and 75 uh, PPFD light intensity of dim blue light plus dim far red. So far red is also important for uh, the phytochrome photoreceptors, the red far red ratio. And then it goes through that throughout the rest of the night, then 8 a.m. and the cycle repeats. So it goes through this light quality shifting thing every day. And I found that there's two key results that came out of it. In one, we measured uh, what the plant's transpiration, so how much its leaves are evaporating water. And that's a function of if everything else is controlled, your, like your vapor pressure deficit, the relative humidity, air temperature, everything is constant except for changing the light quality. And if you see a difference in transpiration, that means that the stomata in the canopy are opening. The stomata that uh, are responsible for the gas exchange, CO2 entering the leaf and water exiting. So I found um, that, you know, transpiration clearly increased when that blue light pulse happened because stomata open in response to blue light. It's a known thing in the literature. And then at night, they closed relatively because the light intensity dimmed, uh, so light intensity also influences stomata, and also far red signals stomata to close as well. So it's like you got this push and this pull strategy every day, opening and closing the stomata. Now, if you look at just the direct effects, which all the literature talks about um, on stomata, then you just be like, okay, well, it's just because you're changing the light intensity and stuff and, and the light quality, and that's affecting the stomata how you know it's circadian rather than what I just described as masking, you know it's circadian when for any given stretch of time, so for example, during the, uh, in the whole plant system, this transpiration experiment, 
it was a 12 hour photo period, subjective photo period. So there's 12 hours of nighttime with this dim blue and dim far red. And you could clearly see uh, over the nighttime at some point, I don't know if it was something like, you know, at midnight or something, the stomata suddenly opened and transpiration suddenly increased. Uh, there was no signal to give it any sort of reason to start opening. There was no light quality change. So it started opening and then it continued to open until the subjective dawn or when the grow light intensity finally shot back up and, and went to its that, that first level I described. So that was that was pretty exciting. You could clearly see it. Like I even did in that presentation little red lines to show that it's like, you know, look, the, the stomata are anticipating the morning or like this oncoming day. So that right there tells you it's circadian. Another thing that tells you it's circadian uh, was the control in that treatment, which was just a high pressure sodium light uh, that was just left on. So hot HPS lights, you can't change the light intensity or quality really. I mean, like maybe there's a fancy one that could maybe dim it a bit, but I don't think that's uh, anyways. So it, it just keeps it, the intensity constant for 24 hours a day steady. So just, we wanted to see, can you see any sort of transpiration rhythms like that? On the first night of extending the photo period, so like literally as soon as night would have started at that 12 hour photo period mark, uh, the stomata started closing on that high pressure sodium light. And it wasn't until like maybe a, a few hours later of the lights just not changing and nothing like night not actually happening, that all of a sudden transpiration stopped decreasing and then just kind of stayed in this like middle range and barely changed for the rest of the 14 day run. So like they, it did increase slightly, but not in any sort of rhythm or anything. It just increased because the plant kind of increased too, uh, the surface area, leaf surface area. So that immediate decrease was a signal in the circadian rhythm to tell the stomata to close. So these are two kind of ways you can now see circadian rhythm and stomatal regulation. Um, that was that part. And then I also did this other experiment in these bio chambers where, again, completely controlled environment. Now I, I was trying to push the envelope. I, I did a 16 hour photo period um, because the longer you could stretch it, the dimmer you could set your lights, the more electrical savings you potentially or electrical pricing you could potentially save on. And uh, very similar pattern. I did a less exaggerated blue pulse. It was only like 100 PPP, uh, PPFD more. And uh, yeah, it was, it grew the plants. Oh yeah, and I grew the plants under that condition from a seedling age, um, about, I think it was about two weeks old. I then transferred them in there and they stayed in that condition for three weeks. So I wanted to assess total biomass, all sorts of morphology, uh, like leaf surface area and stem length and everything like that. Uh, and in cucumber, because it was five to six weeks old, uh, it actually already developed fur, uh, fruit, like its first fruit. Uh, so I got to, you know, look at yield as well. And those results were pretty promising. Um, there is huge morphology differences. Um, so the tomato plants in that case, they elongated. Um, and also, might I add, there were additional controls here. So in the biochambers, uh, those LEDs, I tried to keep the daily light integral of blue fraction of light equivalent across the dynamic and control and constant treatments. I also tried to keep the far red daily light integral the same across all so that we can say it's like um, it's not just the amount of far red you give a plant in the day. It's the exact timing of when you dose that. Uh, that was the kind of takeaway there. But yeah, so anyways, the tomato plants, they grew taller. Uh, they had greater biomass. They, you know, they just looked better. They were more vigorous than even control. So they did better than control in a completely controlled environment. Um, the cucumber, on the other hand, uh, they, there was no statistical difference between 
the dynamic and the control for cucumber. But there's there was both of those were better than under constant 24 hour light. So I'm just kind of throwing the constant 24 hour light under the bus now. We don't need to talk about that anymore. Now we're just trying to focus. Okay, well, how do we optimize? So cucumber, there was no change in total biomass and everything. So that I I was surprised and I was kind of sad because I was looking for some impressive results. Uh, but once I analyzed the data with the yield involved, the harvest index was higher in the cucumber uh, that was under the dynamic LED treatment than the control. And harvest index means the fruit dry weight to total plant dry weight. And also I did it in fresh weight as well. So uh, that means, uh, for those who are familiar with greenhouse production and stuff, uh, even if not, um, there's this whole vegetative to generative balance. If you increase uh, a basic concept, it's like where if you increase the average daily temperature, you get a more vegetative plant. If you increase the daily light integral, you get a more vegetative plant. So growers are always trying to cut, like balance that. And there's other factors that influence it too, like uh, the EC of the nutrient solution and um, uh, deficit irrigation and stuff like that. But, you know, under optimal conditions, that's that. Sorry. Yeah, you got a question. I, I, I keep on going. Sorry, your your audio is cutting out. Sorry. So there's sort of like this uh, balance between how much fruit is produced versus how much uh, leaf and stem is produced, right? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, it's it's like even like fruit, like and flower, like reproductive tissue versus vegetative tissue, and if there's too much of the generative tissue. Uh, that and the plant is really out of balance, then the plant will be stunted and it will have a whole lot of little flowers and stuff, but it won't be able to sustain the fruit and it won't be able to, you know, give a good yield or anything because it doesn't have enough leaf area and leaves to support all of that. So that's, that's an important thing. And if it's overly vegetative, well, it's barely going to produce any fruit and it's going to be this massive plant that's consuming all your resources. Um, so, uh, it seems that the dynamic LED recipe created a slightly more generative plant, not overly generative, because, you know, like it was still vigorous, it was still healthy looking, it still looked great, like similar to control, but it just had a higher yield relatively. Um, and, and that was significant. It was statistic statistically significant. It had a higher yield in fresh weight and it had the higher harvest index. And it also had a lower um, leaf mass to, or like they call it the leaf mass ratio. So the, the amount of leaves for total biomass. Again, another vegetative degenerative index, you could call that. So that was, that was awesome. And then at the a more subtle point on a morphology level, tomato and cucumber seem to respond differently. Um, the tomato, it elongated its stem and it had a higher stem mass fraction. You know, it makes sense. If you're adding far red at night when a plant's more uh, sensitive to far red, um, you know, it's called end of day uh, far red treatment. It's in the literature a lot. Uh, yeah, tomato, you get elongation. Cucumber did not have the stem elongation that tomato had. In fact, it, like, it wasn't statistically different at all from control. However, it had a greater pediol mass fraction. So the pediol is, you know, the little tiny stem that goes to the leaf, basically. Um, and tomato, that was, that was not statistically significant. So I thought it was pretty cool how it's like tomato gets taller, cucumber puts its leaf out further and gets you know, and, and, and manages its canopy like that. So that has implications for future greenhouse trials to assess, you know, how do we manage the whole radiation capture of an entire canopy uh, 
if we know that there's differences. And I, and I believe too, depending on the precise timing of day, you might get more stem versus pedial and cucumber. So there's, there's a lot of research that could happen in that just from these early results. So if I'm getting correct, uh, please let me know if I'm not. Both systems outside the control system led to an increase in overall yield. Um, the one dynamic LED system my, did. My apologies. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, no. And, and then there's a control. I guess I, it's hard for me to like make pictures here. But uh, so there's the dynamic chamber. Then there's the control. And then there's the constant light where you're not, not even changing it and it's just steady. So constant light in all cases was not good. Control and dynamic is what we're comparing. Excellent. So under the di under the dynamic LED system, why did tomatoes and cucumbers respond differently? Is there any specific genetic or morphological features that may have shifted that in certain directions? Well, they're totally unrelated plants. So, I mean, it, it makes sense, like, just from a basic kind of botany level that it's like, okay, yeah, like, they would respond to things differently. Um, but, like, as for the molecular mechanisms, like, I can't, I can't really point to that because I didn't do any of that. <laughs> um, uh, but I think where the grower could get, like, could know how to manage each different kind of crop and there's going to be other crops like eggplants and stuff too um i think it's you'd have to do this whole circadian rhythm uh trait assessment on all the species of choice even the cultivars of choice and so there's a, a specific protocol to look at the circadian rhythm traits but what i believe uh and and so what one is called a protocol is called a phase response curve so a phase response curve tells you at what phase in the circadian rhythm, like what internal time at, you know, your internal 2 a.m. clock versus your internal 2 p.m. clock, at what time of day are you most sensitive to that, or is that cucumber most sensitive to that far red light input to its stem tissue? Remember earlier, I kind of mentioned that different organs of the plant, let's say, uh, might receive energy at different times of day. So I believe like the stem, maybe it receives that signal uh, that would increase its uh, elongation. Let's say it receives it at 7 p.m. internal time. Uh, whereas tomato, maybe it received it at 2 a.m. internal time. And then that's why maybe we had that difference there. So we need to do phase response curves to really answer that question of uh, why it was different. And if it is different in a circadian input kind of way, then that would tell you how you could manage that on like a full scale operation. So speaking of which, there are several different methods you covered within uh, your webinar. Auto dimming, circadian rhythm entertainment, and phenological staging. Could you explain all these systems? Yeah, so uh, there's different things of like how we could program LEDs. And, and it's kind of like my future outlook. Uh, so right now, uh, growers are already using what's called auto dimming. So if the light intensity in a greenhouse by natural sunlight gets to a certain level, Let's say, you know, the sun's here, it's not cloudy at all. Why would you be supplementing LED light or high pressure sodium light if you're getting this saturating amount of light? Like a plant in its light response, a canopy light response curve, it saturates, you know, like up in the 500, even 400 range of PPFD. So why would you be, and, a, and the natural sunlight could be a thousand. So why are you going to add a bit that's just going to get wasted um, as non-photochemical quenching, it's called. Um, so what they do is they'll dim automatically, according to light intensity, all of their lights or even shut them off. That's one level of program control that's automated. A second level is what I'm introducing now as the circadian rhythm entrainment uh, program. 
And this, it needs more research for different crops and stuff. But in general, it's already been shown now on two different, totally different species uh, that are crop worthy species that yes, like they do better under this strategy. Then what you could do, so you have your auto dimming, you have your dynamic LED entrainment, and then uh, nested into that, you could have phenological staging. So this, I was inspired by research I've seen at conferences where they would give different light qualities depending on the life cycle stage of the crop. So lettuce was a good example that this was done on. As soon as the lettuce germinates and it's this young little plant, it takes a long time for it, you know, relatively, it takes a while for it to start to fill out. Uh, in the meantime, between the lettuce plants in the row, uh, and this is like in a vertical farm, let's say, uh, their leaves are so small, it's like they've got all this space. And so it's a waste of light use efficiency. You're just wasting light onto all around the lettuce plants until they fill out. And so how can you close the canopy as fast as possible to be more light use efficient? And how you can do that is you upright or you, you increase your far red dose. So far red is known to induce uh, leaf area expansion uh, in lettuce and other crops too. It's just, it's kind of like a universal response. Um, at dim far red, that's, it does like the light avoidance or sorry, the, uh, the shade avoidance response where it gets like super etiolated and just lanks out. But if you have like a reasonable light intensity and you add far red, it just, it just increases leaf area. But if you grew the crop for the rest of its life under that far red, under a non-dynamic LED, just because the light supplier said, oh yeah, far red boosts yields, um, you're not going to have as much of a benefit uh, because you know, there's, there's some trade-offs in, in biomass gain and stuff, and maybe you'd have to get the, just the right amount of far red. And, um, and then also the antioxidant content and maybe vitamin C content of the lettuce might not be as big because far red doesn't upregulate those as much as uh, other wavelengths such as blue. So what the phenological staging would do then in the first stage of life, you would have relatively more far red in the spectrum get that plant canopy to expand for the first, whatever, two weeks or something. Uh, then you would go to your normal grow light spectrum. So now the canopy's full. Now you can just do a nice efficient grow light spectrum. And then five days before you harvest, you would blast it with a high relative amount of blue light. And if you were to do blue light from the beginning, your plants would have been compact and it would have wasted space because blue light, initiates a compaction of the plant form, a smaller leaf surface area, but thicker. Uh, it also upregulates things like vitamin C and phytonutrients. So you can't give blue light at all times at that intensity to upregulate those things to get that nice red lettuce. Um, but it's enough to just do it five days before you harvest it. So you, you've gained your surface area early in life. You grew your biomass at the efficient uh, LED level or light intensity level and everything. And then right near the end, you just spice it up. It becomes a much healthier lettuce. It's got all the biomass it needs uh, for like normal yield, but now your, your nutritional quality just goes right up. So this is the phenological staging strategy. And I believe you could do the same in tomato. So that research group that did that, um, they also did, uh, they showed the same thing with tomato fruits. Um, so yeah, I think the dynamic strategy nested inside of the, or sorry, the phenology strategy nested inside the dynamic strategy. So you're still having these variations throughout time of day of your blue pulse versus your far red pulse uh, and your grow light spectrum. But now you could change the photo period. You could change the dosages. You could change maybe the precise timing of those doses. And that could improve your overall life cycle efficiency and, and everything like that. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I mean by those different programs and where I see it's going. Sounds good. So uh, do you think that at some point in the future, there will be sort of like a recipe book 
where we could actually uh, create a sort of recipe of light to make an ideal system for different plants that could be actionable by the average greenhouse grower or the average homesteader? Yeah, like, and, and, and in fact, like, I kind of, well, first off, I, I could see it being automated complete. Like, you could just maybe go through an app or something and just be like, lettuce. <laughs> and like, it'll have a whole program ready for it for every day of the month. And it'll give you like your nice quality. And, and that's, that's pretty much what it could be. Um, but like, for a grower or a home hobbyist who's like really curious about breaking the boundaries and trying new things. Um, yeah, like I, I want to one day maybe like write something on it. Well, obviously I'm going to try to publish a lot, but like maybe write like a, a book explaining it. So, and with uh, results in the future <laughs> to try to walk people through it. And it's like, so here's the theory of how to do it. And this, these are the results from these species. We made these pre-programmed ones, but if you want to try to switch it up for your own operation, you could do this. Now, when it gets to the rate right practical level uh, for say a greenhouse grower today, if this product was out there today, what would a greenhouse grower be able to do with it? Um, greenhouse growers, when they go and they look at their crop, they'll, they'll go, they'll look at it right away in their mind, they're assessing the vegetative degenerative balance. That's like a number one thing that they're always looking for. Like they want to make sure their crop is in balance. Of course, last year they've done a whole lot of stuff uh, to improve their system and everything, but just it, maybe they're trying a new cultivar. Uh, so that's going to have a different balance. Then what they'll do, they'll go back to their uh, control system. It could be Argus, Privia, uh, Hugendorn. There's all sorts of different control systems. And then they'll change their set points depending maybe it was a hot day or something too, they'll change their set points and maybe uh, try to increase the light intensity to comp compensate for the hot day or uh, vice versa to try to get back into balance. Um, yeah, so I, I think the grower right now could use it as a balancing tool. Um, and another thing too was I mentioned it in the webinar, but it's like trying to wake the plants up in the morning before sunrise. So if the if like if you know it's going to be a hot day in summer, uh, it's going to be a bright day all week. That's what the Weather Network says. That's actually pretty hard for greenhouse growers to fight off uh, for cooling systems in their greenhouse. The number one cooling system for a greenhouse is the crop itself. The crop is absorbing the sensible heat and radiation uh, from the sun, and then it's converting that sensible heat into latent heat, so into the water vapor itself as it's evaporating. So that's called like evaporative cooling. Uh, we do it when we sweat, so plants do it when they evaporate through their stomata. So if we could wake the plant up, just before sunrise and everything like or, or whatever sufficiently before like i showed in that in the results for my research there um i believe that the plant will reach energy balance sooner and energy balance means that radiation input is being output as latent heat and then it's that humid air is being vented out of the greenhouse so you got this full cycle like you're not having to supply air conditioning and stuff or the wet pad cooling, the crop is able to right away deal with it. And so you're not going to get an overheating or something in the system because you're out of energy balance. So that's, that's distinct from vegetative degenerative balance. They, they like their word balances in the greenhouses, but, uh, but yeah, so, so that, those are kind of two different things that I, I think are very useful to growers that they would catch on to pretty quick if they were to use it today. So, uh... How would you wake the plants up early? What strategies would you use for that purpose? So this um, light recipe that I'm presenting here, if we did the exact same thing that, that I did, uh, instead of in a chamber in a greenhouse, um, well, greenhouse growers right now, they turn their lights on at like 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. in the morning in anticipation of the next day, and then they shut off their lights right at sunset. So that's like the common practice right now. 
So under this system, the grow light uh, intensity would come on at 1 a.m. or whatever. Uh, and then three hours in, so maybe at 4 a.m., then we would apply our bright or our whatever, not even that bright. It's, it's just a blue LED pulse for three hours from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then the sun is rising at like 6 or 7 a.m. So the plant would be already primed like and, and ready to go like by the time it gets there. Um, and that, that exact timing could shift. Like in practice, I'm going to have to kind of figure out exactly um, when the pulse is best. Uh, but yeah, and, and then, uh, yeah, then the lights come dim at the end of the day uh, at sunset, and then they go off to their kind of far red and dim blue. So, yeah, I think that answers your question, I hope. Yes, it does. Uh, I got one more question. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the northern parts of Canada, specifically uh, none of the uh, Northwest Territories on the most extreme end, but also other spots like New Brunswick and Newfoundland, there's interest in greenhouses to uh, increase self-sufficiency in their locations. So do you think this would help in developing the greenhouse industry over there and improve self-sufficiency? Of course, there's a there's a whole area actually didn't even talk about. So what I've been describing this whole time uh, is termed acclimation. So we're acclimating a given genotype, any plant, we're acclimating it by entraining its circadian rhythm. We could also look at circadian rhythms for adaptation. So cultivars that are adapted to northern environments in greenhouses. So I'm not even talking about temperature right now. Uh, I'm glad you brought this one up, actually. I, I don't even think it was in. Uh... Well, OK, I did do it in the webinar and stuff, but OK. So but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm really happy about this one. So uh, in nature, wild species, including insects and plants, have uh, this what's called the latitudinal rule in their circadian rhythms, their internal rhythms. So uh, a species in the equator has a shorter period. So if you know like a sine wave or a cosine wave, right? So when a full wave is complete, that's a period. And as I kind of mentioned before, there's different phases. So a phase is where you are in that period. And the amplitude is how far up and down that period swings. So in the equator, they have a photo or a, a circadian period that is very close to tw or to 24 hours, very close to the actual diurnal rhythm. The further north you go, though, the longer the circadian period gets uh, in this latitudinal gradient. So it gets to be like something like 26 or 27 hours long. So your internal period is longer. So every day, the plant has to sh phase shift back three hours to realign with the 24-hour diurnal rhythm of the environment. Um, and this is also true in like soybean. Soybean is a great example, and that's what's been published, uh, showing it really clearly in plant world, uh, along with wild species. But uh, so soybean, um, if any agronomists are familiar around here, <laughs> There's different zones of soybean growing. So from the equator up north, and it, it's pretty much a latitudinal gradient that kind of shifts depending on maybe water usage and heat units and stuff. But this, lat this zone gradient correlates with the latitudinal gradient, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the zone gradient correlates with the circadian period length which is that latitudinal gradient. So it just, it just shows that breeders, they were breeding for soybeans that did better up north and they didn't even have any idea of circadian rhythm traits. They just selected for random ones that did better. Um, and it just turns out that the ones that did better had longer circadian periods. This translates now into greenhouse crop breeding. So if we selected 
cultivars that have these longer periods, they would just do better under near continuous light conditions that you would find up north. Because up north, during the summertime, depending how far you go, you could have like a 20-hour day length or longer uh, natural in the summertime. And that's just given to you. You don't even have to supplement your light. But maybe you would still need these dynamic LED strategies to control your phenology stages and your morphology because it might get, you know, too weird. That, that's a whole other topic. But point is, is um, I believe uh, for Nunavut and Northwest Territories growing and having greenhouse crops up there, if they use these adapted cultivars, which can be screened in relatively simple assays for their circadian period length, um, immediately they could start with crop with with cultivars of all sorts of crops that do really well there. And you could even select from like organic heirloom varieties uh, if that's their fancy. Like it's it's just all in the circadian rhythm. I think that would give it a good first go at doing well. And then over the winter time, that's a whole other story. Um, you would still apply these acclimation strategies of LEDs. Now you would have to use LEDs a lot more up north uh, because during the winter, there's hardly any light. And um, and yeah, so I mean, their biggest challenge is, is how to get energy. How are you going to get electricity to power a greenhouse, heat a greenhouse, and you know these LEDs and stuff? So that's a challenge that they're trying to face. Um, but it's worth it because, you know, shipping it from somewhere south for, you know, a 12 hour drive up some crappy roads that, you know, that are hard to get up. It's like, uh, they need it. Um, so, so yeah, so both adapted and acclimation strategies are useful up there. Excellent. And to conclude this uh, podcast, I'll ask the same question I ask pretty much every other interviewee. If there's anything, anything you want to say to the audience, uh, any last thoughts or any recommendations or any important messages? Do so or um, for your piece. <laughs> yeah, any, any, uh, I don't know. Are we talking about life in general or research? <laughs> No. Um, or. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, um, I guess follow your intuition. You know, intuition, it gives you good clues. Uh, and then you could kind of look for the evidence once you are guided by the intuition. So don't just spit it out when you have an intuition about something, but try to get some data and then then you're good. Um and, and yeah, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm at a loss right now what exactly to say. I mean, I think I shared enough, like, crazy ideas and concepts here that I definitely need to unpack more, especially for people who, who haven't researched LEDs and stuff. Uh, even people who have might not have heard some of these things. So um, I totally recommend yeah just looking at the literature with those keywords that i've used um and and yeah <laughs> thank you i appreciate the time yeah no problem thanks for having me thank you for watching this video if you enjoyed this video please like and subscribe if you really enjoyed it and think you can donate you can do so at buy me a coffee link in the description below Thank you for watching.